So I'm going to take the first couple of minutes today just to kind of frame in terms of the challenges that we face and how these different sessions that we'll have in today's uh, workshop fit together. Uh, so first of all, um, we know that there's a growing energy demand for computing and communications. So this is um, sourced from nature showing that um, if you look at information and communication technology today, typically referred to as ICT, so this includes personal digital devices, mobile phones, and so on, it already accounts for more than 2% of the global demand. And you might ask, what does 2% mean? Well, this is on par with the aviation industry's um, admission of fuel. So that's already quite significant. And as part of that, data centers also account for 1% of the global electricity demand. Um, and this is more uh, than the energy consumption of some countries. And we can see that this projection keeps on going up. So we can see that computing and communications are really going to be a challenge in terms of its energy demand. And one thing I should note is that this projection was made in 2015. And this is prior to the wide use of deep neural networks, which is really a key kind of cornerstone of this whole AI uh, revolution that we've been seeing. Um, so since then, we can see that the compute demands for deep neural networks has also grown very rapidly. Um, and in fact, it was highlighted by The Economist um, in one of their articles uh, just in 2020. And one of the reasons for this is the amount of compute that I'm going to be talking to you today about sustainable computing and machine learning platforms at Google. Um, and I'm presenting the work of literally thousands of people at Google who work on our sustainability efforts and our machine learning uh, platforms efforts. Um, so uh, in fact, I'm going to be talking to you about three things. So first, operating in an environmentally sustainable way has always been a core value of our company. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about three asset aspects of that today. Uh, the first is about Google's data centers and how we make them and design them to be efficient and how we're on a path to becoming carbon free in our uh, operations. I'm going to talk to you about sustainable machine learning, building specialized hardware to make machine learning more efficient and about carbon emissions of machine learning. And then I'll talk to you about Google's products. How do we use computation and information to help others be more sustainable? So here are a couple of really important milestones from our first two decades of climate action. Um, in 2007, uh, we became the first company, major company to become, to be carbon neutral. And in 2017, we reached 10 consecutive years of being carbon neutral. And we also became the first major company to match 100% of our annual electricity use with renewable energy worldwide. Part of the way we're able to uh, achieve this is by building data centers so that they're efficient and they tend to work on carbon-free energy. Data, if you haven't seen a large-scale data center, you know I'm going to take you on a brief tour. Uh, so this is our Google data center in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and the uh, area you see there is about the size of 235 football fields, either American or uh, soccer fields, uh, depending on your, your choice of sport. Uh, but it's a pretty big facility. Uh, around those buildings is about a good 2.7 mile or five kilometer-ish hike. And if you go inside, there's lots and lots of servers in racks. Um, in particular, the servers have been designed so that there's uh, really good airflow so that you don't need as much cooling. The uh, cooling facilities have been designed uh, extensively to uh, be able to cool, cool the, um, the computing equipment with, without too much excess energy. Um, the uh, power distribution systems have all been uh, fairly efficiently designed so you don't lose much in, in uh, sort of conversion from the energy coming into the data center to the energy reaching the actual computing equipment. Um, and one of the ways you measure the efficiency of a data center in terms of how much is uh, what's called the power utilization uh, efficiency, which is how much energy do you put into the overall data center facility uh, divided by how much energy reaches the actual computing equipment. Perfect would be 1.0. Uh, typical data centers in the industry are about 1.67 or so these days in 2019. Uh, we've actually been uh, around 1.22 in 2009, and we've been on a steady curve of reducing that over year over year so that we're now at about 1.1 uh, 
so 10% excess energy uh, doesn't reach the uh, computing equipment that's used for cooling and other kinds of, of things. Uh, and then uh, all the other uh, energy reaches the computing equipment. So that means you need less energy for doing computations. And one of the things I'm really excited about is at the end of 2020, uh, we announced our third decade of climate action. And this is a pretty ambitious set of goals. Um, and I'll just highlight one. There was a blog post by Sundar uh, Pichai, our CEO. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the things we set out in that blog post is we intend to operate on carbon-free energy, our entire business, 24-7 by 2030. And this is uh, a really difficult goal, but it's one that we are sort of on a path to meeting. And I'm going to talk to you now for a few minutes about how we're going to achieve this. So first, let's talk about the difference between carbon neutral, 100% renewable energy and 24 seven carbon free energy. So carbon neutral means that you have uh, achieved uh, carbon neutrality for a set of energy consumption you have by purchasing carbon offsets that reduce or prevent global emissions equal to the amount that you're, you're generating in your operations. Um, 100% renewable means that you achieve this by purchasing enough renewable energy to match your annual electricity use. But for example, it does allow you to consume energy in Oregon in February and purchase renewable energy in Georgia in uh, December <clears throat> in order to meet that goal. So all the, the books match and so on on an annual basis, but not necessarily in exactly the same spot at the same time. So 24 seven carbon energy is more than that. It's achieving cl using clean energy for every location and every hour of operations all the time. So basically, if you're consuming energy in Oregon every hour, you have to be uh, uh, sourcing clean energy for that for that energy use. And in 2019, we were at about 61% of our energy usage met this definition. 2020, we're at 67%. And as I mentioned, the goal is 2030, we will be at 100% for this metric. So let's talk about this, uh, carbon-free energy. And one of the ways we're achieving this is we are the world's largest annual corporate purchaser of renewable energy because we need to uh, essentially uh, purchase enough renewable energy to cover our operations at this 24 by seven uh, measure. And so if you look at our renewable energy uh, purchasing compared to our total electricity use, I mentioned this is the milestone we first achieved in 2017 and we achieved it for the last four years, uh, we've matched 100% of the electricity consumption of our operations with renewable energy. And the way we've done this is we've invested uh, in more than 55 renewable energy projects worldwide, nearly six gigawatts of renewable power, uh, mostly wind and solar, which you see here. And uh, we're gonna focus a bit on Chile. So there's two solar projects and a wind project. And so here's the scenario. We have a data center in Cuilicura, Chile, uh, just a little bit north of Santiago. And without solar and wind uh, purchasing agreements, uh, these are called PPAs, power purchasing agreements, less than half our energy use in Chile would be matched with carbon-free sources on an hourly basis. So what you see here is a yearly view of this data center uh, in the x-axis, and then in the y-axis is the time of day for each day throughout the year. And so uh, this is kind of the status quo of what the local uh, energy grid will provide you in terms of carbon-free energy. It's about 42% carbon-free energy, mostly during the day. You can see the green part there is mostly during the daylight hours. Um, but we uh, did a PPA for 80 megawatts of solar. And what that has done is enabled us to substantially increase to carbon-free energy usage uh, to 63% for the data center, mostly again during the daylight hours because the solar is uh, not so helpful at night. Um, and uh, that's great. And then what you see is projected for 2022, we now have additional uh, projects, uh, new 35 megawatt solar and a new 90 megawatt wind power purchasing agreement. And what those allow us to do is by having two solar uh, facilities that are in slightly different places that enable us to have more reliable solar energy during the day. And the wind is able to fill in most of the gaps at night for uh, 
ensuring that we get carbon-free energy. And so we're projecting, this is a projected view of 2022 with these facilities uh, and operating is um, greater than 95% carbon-free energy for this data center uh, on a 24 by seven, you know, hour by hour basis. And so this is the kind of work we're doing throughout the world that all of our different data centers, looking at where we can build the data centers, looking at where we can source uh, carbon-free energy from, where we can invest and give PPA uh, purchase agreements to incent uh, power providers to build carbon-free energy facilities. <clears throat> and so five of our data centers now operate near or at 90% carbon-free energy. As of the end of 2021, uh, next year, we expect to be able to add uh, Chile and perhaps others to this list. And this is on our path to uh, the 100% goal I mentioned in 2030. Uh, one of the things we've also done is enabled our cloud customers to select which cloud region they want to run their computation in, and they can decide uh, how, um, how important it is that they have a low carbon footprint or how important price is or how important latency is. And it will show our cloud customers which uh, data center region will give them the, the um, uh, least uh, sort of uh, carbon footprint for the computations they want to do. Okay, machine learning. So there's definitely increasing usage of machine learning. I'm sure everyone has noticed. And one of the things in the last decade that uh, the community has observed is that scaling of these models and data sets often yields improved accuracy for really important tasks. And so more computational power for the kinds of machine learning computations is needed. And machine learning is really transforming how we think about designing computers. Machine learning based uh, accelerators are a thing that can dramatically improve the efficiency of machine learning computations. And so we've been uh, doing this for quite a while. We recognized in about 2013 or 2014, that this is gonna be an important aspect of building uh, important machine learning platforms. And so this ML optimized hardware uh, that we've started working on and now have several generations of is much more power efficient uh, and energy efficient and enables these larger scale models with both lower economic and lower energy costs and therefore lo lower uh, carbon emissions costs. So the first uh, such accelerator that we built, uh, TPU V1, TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit, uh, was a chip designed for neural net inference when you already have a trained model and you sort of want to just get predictions from that model. Uh, and it's been in production use since 2015 it's uh, used on search queries. It's used for our translation system, for speech recognition, image recognition. And it was actually used by our DeepMind colleagues during the AlphaGo match. So actually, this is the, in the data center in Iowa uh, that I visited. And I got to fix a little uh, Go board to the side of this as a commemorative thing. This was the two racks of TPU v1 uh, cards that uh, Lisa et al. and Koji were competing against. Um, and at the time when this uh, chip was released, compared to contemporary GPUs and CPUs, uh, this system actually provided an 80x incremental performance per watt versus uh, the contemporary CPUs and a 30x incremental performance per watt compared to contemporary GPUs. And so you see that building specialized hardware for machine learning computations really does give you substantial increases in energy efficiency. Um, since then, We've been building uh, subsequent versions of these designed for both training and inference. So TPU v2 in 2017, TPU v3 in 2018, and TPU v4 in 2020 with dramatic increases in the uh, amount of computation per chip and as well as uh, you know, energy efficiency uh, that makes it much better for machine learning computations than other platforms. And these are designed to be connected together in larger configurations that we call pods. So they have sort of custom interconnects that can dramatically lower the energy for larger scale computations that are bigger than one chip. So the V2 pod you see in the top there, the V3 pod, and then the V4 pod is 4,096 of these chips, 1.1 exaflops of power. Um, the last two pod generations are liquid cooled. So it's always exciting to have uh, uh, water and your computer chips in close proximity. Okay, so that leads us to the emissions of uh, machine learning, particularly for uh, training. So there's lots of external interest on energy consumption and CO2 emissions of machine learning computations recently. And you see a bunch of papers here 
Um, and, uh, you know, it makes the cover of CACM with articles about the green AI uh, approach, which is how can you build more efficient systems and algorithms for doing machine learning, which we think is a great trend. And it's also led to a bunch of Malthusian predictions about the carbon emissions of machine learning training. So for example, uh, one article said, uh, the environmental cost to improve an ML task, the answers are grim. Training such a model would cost $100 billion and produce as much carbon emissions as New York City does in a month. Um, and another article said, in fact, by 2026, the training cost of the largest AI model predicted by the compute demand trend line would cost more than the total US GDP. So these are pretty dire predictions. Uh, so let's dive into them a little bit. Um, some of them are actually based on inaccurate estimates and interpretations of uh, machine learning training. So let's talk about that. Uh, neural architecture search is a technique that Google developed and is one key source of some of these misconceptions. So first, let me tell you what neural architecture search is. So it's a way of coming up with uh, interesting new machine learning models that can be used for a wide variety of tasks in a particular domain. And the way it works is the idea is you will have a model generating model and you're going to train the model to generate particular kinds of model architectures and then evaluate how well those work. So the loop is sort of like generate 10 models, train them for a few hours and use the loss or the accuracy of the generated models as a reinforcement learning signal to the model generating model. And then you can generate additional models based on this feedback and those models get better and better. And so the neural architecture search approach is you iterate this many, many times and your model architectures that are proposed get better and better. And you end up with a particular architecture that you think is that the system uh, has shown is really good for the kinds of problems you care about. And it's sort of like automating the research process of researchers investigating uh, machine learning architecture. Um, and it actually works. So here is a graph uh, showing image net accuracy on the y-axis and then computational cost of model of a particular model on the x-axis. And what you see is that there are a whole bunch of models on this gray dotted line that were designed by human machine learning experts uh, and with different trade-offs of amount of computation and accuracy. Uh, and then there was some work uh, that we published in uh, 2017 that is on the dotted blue line. You see that outperforms the Pareto frontier of the human designed machine learning models. And in 2019, we made some additional improvements to the way in which we searched for uh, good architectures for computer vision. And that's the red line there, which is dramatically better than the best uh, models uh, sort of come up uh, developed by human experts. And this is true for image recognition, it's true for object detection. Again, you see uh, you know, slightly different metrics, but up, up and to the left is good. And it's true for language translation. So this was some work uh, by So et al to develop a, uh, uh, the transformer model is the black line there, which is a popular machine learning architecture, model architecture for uh, natural language processing and more recently for vision and speech recognition of various things. And the red line there is the evolved transformer that the AutoML search for uh, run by So et al came up with. So there are a few misconceptions though about neural architecture search. So one is that uh, some believe that neural architecture search is done on every problem, but it's not. It's a one-time cost that you do per problem domain search space in order to come up with a high quality model architecture that works for problems in that domain, like natural language processing or image recognition. And these discovered model architectures are often open source so that everyone can use them. And there you see a few links to open sourced model architectures and they get reused thousands of times for different problems in the same problem domain. And due to this reuse, the more efficient models lead to overall energy savings and less CO2 emissions, even though you paid some uh, energy cost in order to do the neural architecture search. And the second misconception is some believe that neural architecture search is actually done on full-size problems, when in fact the search is usually do is, is done using much, much smaller proxy tasks. You're training on very tiny uh, data sets and th very tiny model uh, instantiations of the model architecture. And this proxy task approach 
makes the search itself much more efficient. And so one paper uh, attempted to estimate the CO2 emissions of the evolved transformer search run by Soedal. Uh, it was a bit hampered by the fact that Soedal did not include CO2 emissions data in, in the paper, in their original paper. Uh, that's something we're trying to have our, our Google researchers actually do now is include CO2 emissions for any of our research work that involves you know, significant application uh, just to make this um, you know, problem not happen again. But in the other paper, they modeled a P100 GPU instead of the TPU V2 where the neural architecture was actually run. And they modeled a US average data center instead of a Google data center. And so that meant their, their emissions estimate was actually five times higher than the actual mass. And they also assumed the use of full model uh, 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 tasks instead of these small proxy tasks for the search, as was described by So et al., although admittedly a bit subtly. And so the actual NAS was 19x less compute and emissions because of this proxy task issue. Um, and so therefore, they arrived at an estimate of 284 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions for the evolved transformer NAS, which was actually about 88 times higher than the actual emissions, and also presented this as an every problem cost rather than a one-time cost. And subsequent authors have, have uh, definitely uh, uh, sort of felt that this was uh, sort of interpreted that this was at every problem cost, not a one-time cost. And so obviously this led to fairly dramatic headlines about, you know, uh, you know training an AI model is uh, emitting as much carbon as five cars in their lifetime. Uh, so the environmental quote from the earlier paper is partially derived from, from that earlier uh, paper's conclusions about the neural architecture search cost. Fortunately, things are not so dire. So, as I said, the one-time cost of the evolved transformer mass search that was done by Soedal on the actual hardware in the da Google Data Center in Georgia where the search was run generated 3.2 tons of CO2e, not 284 tons, so 88 times less. And that, that, that more efficient model that was discovered by that has been open sourced so that everyone in the natural language processing community and ML community can use it. And there's the GitHub link. Uh, there's more details in these two uh, papers uh, linked below. <clears throat> uh, secondly, the actual evolved transformer model is more efficient. So it takes many fewer floating point operations and less energy to reach the same or higher accuracy than the base transformer model, which is what most people uh, use for these sorts of problems. And so, for example, in a Google Iowa data center on the P100 GPUs that uh, the other paper used, uh, it's about 16% more energy efficient. On the TPU V2, it, where the search was actually done, it's 25% uh, more energy efficient to achieve the same or slightly better accuracy. And so, actually, training an NLP model of the scale examined by the, the Struble et al. paper that I mentioned, using the discovered evolved transformer on the ML efficient hardware in a Google Data Center in Iowa takes 122, 120 TPU V2 hours, costs about $40 if you use our cloud pricing to, to run it on those uh, devices, and generates 0 0.0024 tons of CO2e, not 284 tons. That's 2.4 kilograms, or about 118,000 times less than the estimates from that paper. Um, that's roughly the emissions cost of producing a liter of milk. And so the good news is there's substantial improvements possible if you, uh, in reducing the carbon emissions and energy usage of machine learning uh, training systems. Uh, and the energy efficiency in machine learning can be approved by using four best practices, the four M's of ML efficiency. Um, the first is the model, the transformer model that uh, Struble et al. examined. Uh, and the baseline here is 1.0, which is the hardware configuration and model that Struble et al. were examining in terms of NLP uh, model cost. And uh, these things are improvements that you can make that give you an uh, equivalent model uh, able to achieve the same accuracy. And so using Primer, which is a more recent uh, model architecture that was developed for the same kinds of tasks, is about four times as efficient as the transformer uh, using energy efficient uh, ML hardware that's been designed for the tasks, TPU v4, 
uh, instead of the P100 is 14 times as energy efficient. And these are all multiplicative. Uh, using a energy efficient data center like Google's data center with a PUE of like 1.1 or so is much better than using the global average data center, uh, which has got a higher PUE. So that gives you a factor of 1.4 improvement. And then because we're sourcing carbon-free energy, if you were to run this, for example, in Google's Oklahoma data center, uh, that's about nine times uh, reduction in carbon emissions over uh, using the average US energy mix. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that there's a whole bunch of algorithmic improvements. Uh, so things like sparsity, you have a large model, but you only activate a tiny portion of it for any given example or token. Uh, it also can give dramatic improvements in reduction in energy, reduction in, in carbon emissions. And so this is just one such paper uh, from uh, William Fettis, Berdzoff, and Noam Shazir, which gives about a 7x speed up using the same hardware to reach the same level of accuracy for a language modeling task. Okay, so what we hope and predict for the future of ML training, there are best practices for each ML community. All of these are in use today and available to anyone. Um, first, data center providers should publish the PUE, the percentage of carbon-free energy, and the CO2E per megawatt hour per location so customers who care can understand and can reduce their energy consumption or carbon footprint by choosing the data center that best uh, meets their, their desired uh, carbon emissions and other trade-offs. ML practitioners should train using the most effective processors in the greenest data center they have access to. Often today, these are cloud providers or well-designed supercomputer facilities. And ML researchers should continue to develop more efficient ML models and publish energy consumption and carbon footprint to foster competition on these uh, important metrics. And if all ML communities follow these best practices, this will create a virtuous cycle that we believe will bend the curve to flatten and eventually shrink CO2E due to ML training uh, by, for example, running in 24 by 7, 100% carbon-free energy uh, data centers. Let me talk very briefly about some uh, things that we do in Google's products to empower others to make sustainable choices. Um, so one of the nice things you can do is use machine learning to help understand the world, understand information, and enable people to, to see that information and make them uh, have uh, the ability to make choices. So one of the things we've done is in a project called uh, Project Simroof, is we've analyzed using machine learning the uh, roof area and sort of solar potential of 170 million rooftops around the world in 21,000 cities. And you can just point at a particular location and see what the solar potential would be for installing solar panels on that particular roof. Uh, normally, you would have to have a solar installer kind of come out and squint at the roof and measure things with a protractor. But here, you can just do it in your browser. And so that can lead to people making interesting energy choices uh, very with less friction. Um, we also use similar kinds of approaches to analyze uh, data uh, that we have available from our, map, from our MAPS product and aggregate it in ways that can enable city planners to get insights into you know, where are emissions coming from their city and their, uh, their community um, and help them make decisions about what should they invest in and what kinds of things should they focus on. We have about 400 cities using this uh, Environmental Insights Explorer tool today, and we aim to help more than 500 cities reduce an aggregate of one gigaton of carbon emissions annually by 2030. Um, within Google Maps, you know, we provide a lot of suggestions to people about how to get from place A to place B, and we've been using uh, eco-friendly routing so we can analyze the routing and figure out which one will generate the least carbon emissions if you were to take this path versus that and suggest that to people uh, if it doesn't uh, significantly change their time for arrival, which is great. Uh, and we've also been in our flights product uh, actually showing people the carbon emissions of particular flights. So taking this kind of airplane versus this kind of airplane or one with a stop versus a non-stop can have very different uh, ramifications in terms of carbon emissions. And so we wanna sort of make that information available and accessible to people so that they can make decisions based on it. Uh, I'll just highlight the environmental reports, which highlight a lot of the activity that I've summarized here. 
uh, that we put out every year at our sustainability.google site slash reports. Uh, there's a hundred reports of various kinds, uh, in particular, the annual environmental report is quite interesting, I think. And we're constantly looking for ways to advance sustainability, both for our own operations and also to empower others to do the same. You can read about our progress and explore things at sustainability.google. Uh, very much appreciated uh, the opportunity to speak today, and I hope everyone went well, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, um, for your great talk. And also, let me take this opportunity to introduce you because I got cut off before. Uh, so this is Dr. Jeff Dean, um, who is a Google Senior Fellow leading Google Research, which focuses on basic computer science and AI research. And their use in important problem domains. Uh, his work has been integral to much of Google's infrastructure and um, developer and machine learning tools. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank um, you, appreciate it. <laughs> thanks and for jumping in at the line. Um, okay, so I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dario. So Dario Grill, Dr. Dario Grill is an IBM <laughs> Senior Vice President and Director of Research. He leads the technology uh, roadmap and technical community of IBM directing innovation strategies in the area, including hybrid cloud, AI, semiconductors, quantum computing, and uh, exploratory science. Uh, Dario, please take it away. Thank you, Vivian, very, very much. And uh, thank you, Anantha and the MIT team for uh, inviting me to speak today. So let me see if I share. Okay, there you go. You have them. Let me see if I can. Uh, if I share the screen right now, can you all see it? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Terrific. So I thought to um, you know to add to the discussion and the wonderful presentation that Jeff just showed across different dimensions, I would focus um, today on uh, on a couple of topics. Uh, some of them touching a little bit more with uh, the world of material science and and, uh, and hardware and new computing paradigms. So I want to say um, a couple of things about uh, the process of a horizontal technology of how do we reduce the cost, um, you know, and the energy uh, consumption of the process of manufacturing semiconductors and manufacturing the core systems that go into uh, into all the computer environments that we use. And I also want to talk a little bit about um, the reducing the costs associated with running computing systems and just the virtue of specialization as a mechanism. And I'm gonna give a, a few examples of, of, of each. So I wanna spend a few minutes sharing with you uh, a few different technologies, uh, touching on the topic of, of course, of uh, energy efficiency. So the first example I wanna give is in a horizontal technology, is what happens when we make advances that allow us to build much more efficient transistors and much more efficient core computing architectures that then can be used on a plethora of uh, different computational environments. So let's call that a horizontal technology. And then I want to give quickly just four examples of having specialization, because I think part of the answer of how we make computing much more uh, sustainable has to do with uh, specialized uh, architectures that have very high level of utilizations and that we are as elegant as possible in the design of the architectures to match the nature of the problem. So I want to give examples for transaction processing, for data storage to you know, tell you a little bit of an unconventional uh, approach to it, on um, briefly on AI hardware, and then I'll give an example also on quantum uh, systems. So first, um, it's really, really important and a piece of advocacy I want to you know, continue to make the case for uh, all the you know, students that are listening is to continue to uh, make progress and, uh, and explore an interest in advancing semiconductor technology. I think you all know in the, you've seen in the headlines, the critical dependency that the entire world has on semiconductors. We have so much work to do uh, to continue to scale the technology and to revive manufacturing capacity in a much more geographically dispersed manner, including in the United States. And when we make innovations and advances in this space, it can make a huge difference. I mean, I'll give you an example of a you know, really beautiful result that is the fruit of many hundreds uh, of, of IBMers and collaborators working on this technology, which was the introduction of the first two nanometer technology uh, node capability that we announced in May of last year. And when you look at it, if you, if you maintain, if you made the choice of maintaining uh, equivalent performance to seven nanometer technology, 
you could actually reduce the power consumption of uh, the entire chip uh, by 75% uh, compared to the previous nodes. And this was due to uh, you know, just fantastic innovations at the level of semiconductor devices, materials, and nanotechnology and fabrication processes, whereby significantly improving the electrostatics associated with a device called the nanosheet uh, that allows you to sort of like stack and control the gate uh, much more ex exquisitely compared to the traditional, you know, the, the more recent FinFET devices, it really allows you to, um, you know, achieve, uh, you know, much better power consumption compared to previous technology. So, in fact, this, this journey of allowing us to have, uh, you know, scale devices, um, the next evolution, even after nanosheets, if we think, you know, beyond two nanometers, will be to uh, you know, move into the Z dimension. So we've also introduced in collaboration with Samsung another device called the VT-FET, the vertical transistor, fill effect transistor. And in this case, you know, the, the, the advantage of this is now current is not flowing out of the paper, like in the case of the nanosheets that you saw stack, but rather current is flowing vertically in this, um, you know, in this vertical, vertical stack. And you can achieve, again, you know, if you compare, for example, to a scale FinFET device like are being used today in seven nanometer technology, you can achieve 85% less power consumption uh, as an example. And, and, you know, part of the advantage of it is by going into the, the vertical dimension, you no longer have to have dummy gates that occupy more real estate and as a consequence of that consume, consume more, more power. So... I guess this is, you know, an example of saying there are very fundamental technologies at the levels of material science, fabrication, devices, and architecture that is something that can lift all boats. Because in the end, it is the building blocks that allows all computing technology to be built uh, from. And therefore, you know, I just want to encourage everybody that we got to pay a lot of attention and, uh, and continue to be very innovative. Uh, to deliver uh, power efficiency associated with these core building blocks. So let me now give quickly a couple, uh, a few examples of going a little bit further on the stack, but taking a more systems-like approach to integrate this technology and, um, and just explore the virtue of specialization and sometimes unconventional solutions to known problems. So one of them is uh, Jeff, I think, did a, a wonderful job explaining the power of specialization in the context of a specific workload. And one of the workloads uh, that he was highlighting that, you know, we're all, you know, using so much is, of course, the world of deep neural networks and, you know, and, and the virtue of having accelerators to be able to achieve much higher le levels of efficiency uh, associated with that workload. Well, you know, if you segment the world in different kinds of workloads, uh, you you see as an example that there is a world of transaction processing, right? So think about you know credit card pay payments and airline reservations and you name it, which underpins like the financial sector, the telecommunication sector, the airlines, etc. And um, in this case, you know, uh, I'll give you an example of an integrated system that we take a lot of pride in in uh, in, in IBM, which is IBM Z, which allows you to have in a, you know, a single server to process a trillion web transactions a day. You can process 19 billion encrypted transactions a day. And, and what is amazing is you can actually build machines through specialization that you can actually have nine, uh, seven nines of availability. So the average time unplanned downtime of a machine like this a year is just uh, three seconds uh, in, in a whole year. And because they run at extraordinarily levels of utilization, compared to less specialized infrastructures associated with the workload, which is the world of transactions, um, you can actually uh, achieve 50% less power utilization or 75% less floor space compared to a more general purpose or, you know, general purpose oriented architecture like say x86, which, you know, I mean, for a single server is the equivalent of removing 18 cars from the road without compromising any aspect of, of performance. So one sort of macro trend, I talked about a foundation one, but one macro trend is let's build specialized systems that are purpose fit for the workload that are needed. Um, you know, without sacrificing uh, the need to develop software agility and to integrate with, with other systems. I'll give you a second example of that. And this one, you know, it may, it may come across as like, what, you know, we're, you know, we're still using tape. Um, but uh, I think it's actually a fascinating example of uh, an incredible technology that is gonna see a growing, a growing utilization and renaissance. 
And that has to do with, with the explosion of data that uh, we all have. And if you think about the world of photographs, you know, just think of how many photographs we all upload and save on the cloud and on our devices. And, uh, and if you think about it, honestly, are you really retrieving all of those photographs on a continuous basis, right? And, and the answer to that, of course, is no. And that uh, you could make sort of this distinction between hot data that you need to have extremely low latencies of retrieval for which you can use, you know, hard disk drives and flash and so on. And then you have an iceberg really of cold data that you could tolerate modestly higher levels of latency. And if you actually look in the level of CO2 emissions for these kind of like data storage, and you take an approach where you were storing everything on a hard disk drive, and you compare it to a, misc, uh, a mix of hard disk drive and tape, or you store the 100% on tape, you can achieve massive levels of uh, CO2 reductions per uh, amount of data uh, stored. So, so um, there's this also a further advantage that in the fabrication process itself compared to, to, uh, to tape when we compare to hard disk drives in terms of like the disposal, the end-to-end -end cycles uh, around that. Um, there's also benefits of like air gapping uh, the technology. So there's a whole host of other sort of like interesting benefits by looking at the problem more holistically and integrating the different types of storage for what they are uh, best suited to do. You know, and when you need hard disk drives, you use them for that. But the opportunity to lower uh, carbon emissions per data store is absolutely extraordinary of what you can do with this. Let me just point out that the technology behind it is amazing. So if you like the world of nanoscale, um, it's, uh, it's really a tour de force in terms of the design of the tape and the evolution of the materials, like the evolution right now of strontium ferrite particles uh, that allows us to have a much stronger uh, set of magnetic particles and allow us to create domains of ever smaller size. So what you're seeing on the top, on the tape, you have these tracks. Each track has its independent domains. And then you have the right driver that actually floats over the tape, uh, you know, with like, you know, fuse, you know, tens of nanometers uh, distance around that. You are able to then, by inducing this, um, this current, uh, be able to, you know, create and, and write the magnetic field. And then you have the ability to, to read it as you scan the tape uh, over, over the reader. And, you know, and, and if you look kind of behind the scenes, it's, it's really impressive, right? You gotta be scanning this tape at six meters per second while, uh, you know, over the surface having a track width of 56 nanometers on the track width with the reader on top of it. The tape thickness as it's moving six meters per second is just four microns of thickness. You have 1.2 kilometers uh, of this uh, tape and you can achieve really, really impressive levels of aerial density around it. And a cartridge can have 580 terabytes uh, of, of storage. So it's actually a very impressive technology that continues to, to evolve. And as we go and we continue the explosion of data, you know, how we store the data, I think is gonna be part of the equation that we gotta pay you know, enormous attention. Um, to add just briefly a complementary discussion to, to what Jeff talked about um, and in the world of AI hardware. Um, so one of, one of the trends, of course, uh, of specialization with, with uh, AI-specific hardware for, uh, for deep learning and deep neural nets has been the evolution of the architecture of the chips themselves to uh, reduce the precision uh, inherently in the architecture. You don't need uh, for obvious reasons, 32 bits of precision uh, for neither training nor inferencing. And you've seen here a sort of a roadmap of, of work, uh, you know, of research activities that we've done uh, for quite a few years right now uh, of systematic demonstrating going from 32 bits to 16 bits to 8 bits to 4 bits um, uh, for both training, which is the upper curve, and for inferencing, which is the lower curve, uh, while maintaining accuracy, very importantly. So this kind of like joint energy efficient resilience optimization between models and hardware, as Jeff alluded, is extremely important. And the design of the architecture of the processors, one vector being reduced precision, has been very important to, to improve efficiency. Um, you know, sort of next up is, uh, you know, how can we actually continue to innovate on the devices themselves such that we can remove the von Neumann uh, bottleneck of having to store weights in memory 
and then doing the processing, uh, you know, with with the transistor, the traditional transistors, and having to go back and forth to retrieve and store weights. And you know, of course, this is a well, you know, ever ever since systolic arrays and so on, is a well explored area in computer science. The idea that you can implement um, architectures. Uh, where you do a mapping uh, between the neural networks and uh, and these sort of matrix-like structures, and um, and what you can do is basically uh, you know combine the computing processing uh, and in, in inside the unit cell that you see here, you combine the sort of transistor-like function with a memory-like function uh, inside the same device. So in in this case, uh, you know by having a, a resistive material that is present. Uh, in the device, you can use the resistive materials to actually store the weights uh, of the neural network. And then you also have the transistor-like function allowing current to pass or not. And then you take just a, a clever advantage of Kirchhoff's law, V equals IR. And then as a consequence of that, you can apply a voltage. And when you read a column, you get sort of the multiplication that is inherent on the multiply accumulate function of neural networks for free. So there's a lot of cleverness in the implementation of this. So it goes down to then, uh, can you make the material? Can you make the devices that exhibit those properties? So simplistically, you can say, well, I can just use a memory device. Uh, but, but the reality of it is that the requirements for applying such memory-like devices for neural networks is different. Meaning, you know, in a memory device, you typically only care about two states to store a zero or a one. Um, you also have very high um, you know, it has to be very fast, sort of like nanosecond and beyond latencies of moving between different states. And, uh, and you need a very high signal uh, to noise ratio around that. And, and actually the shape of, uh, you know, the hysteresis loop of the memory doesn't really matter. What matters is you transition from zero and one and one to zero. In the case of if you're trying to use these kinds of novel devices for neural networks, you, the requirements are very different. Now you need to store many levels of, of weights, not just a zero and one, right? To be able to, to use it in the neural net. Um, you can afford to be slower compared to a memory device. And, um, and then you do need symmetry of, you know, going from zero to one and one to zero across the different states. So there's been a wonderful field of research across many kind of different devices, everything from using phase change memory to resistive random access memory uh, to ferroelectric devices, photonic, you know, magnetic domain wall uh, motions. It's a rich field of, um, of exploration. And, you know, this is an area where we've been very active to push the frontiers. We've shown um, examples of using uh, uh, phase change memory, but uh, adapted. Uh, for the context of creating, in this case, an analog AI chip. Uh, we've also built chips that are like mixed digital and analog. Uh, we can sort of like, you can tune the precision depending on, on your needs. So this is an example of a chip we built that has, uh, you know, over 700,000 phase change memory devices that go from crystalline to amorphous, um, you know, depending on, on the control signal that we have. And we use it to be able to store in a controllable fashion the weights of, of the neural net. So this is just a an exploration, I'm not even talking about neuromorphic uh, devices going beyond, because here we're still exploring the utilization of the algorithms we know that work, you know, in terms of, you know, large-scale neural networks. If you want to go, obviously, to synaptic uh, processors and so on, that's an even, you know, further extra, uh, extrapolation of possibilities, but, you know, it has the caveats of, of algorithmic um, performance uh, in, in present. So the last topic, I just want to very briefly uh, issue a comparison compared to uh, high performance computing is, is the world of quantum computers. So here we're talking about, um, you know, something incredibly ambitious, uh, technically, in which we are, it's a refoundation of the world of information theory, <laughs> no more and no less. So here we are not even taking the, the bit as sacred. So by reformulating information theory, incorporating principles of quantum physics, we can build entirely new classes of machines and entirely new classes of systems. And the reason this matters is because there are many classes of problems that we care deeply about the world and are famously simulating nature itself, simulating physics and chemistry and material science, which incidentally is going to be the basis of some of the most existential problems we confront as a society. In the end, if you want to build a better catalyst for an industrial process, or you want to build, you know, a better battery technology or better fertilizers for agriculture, et cetera, uh, you know, you're going to involve the world of discovering new materials with the right properties 
that allows us to deal with um, you know, the carbon uh, challenges that we confront and the energy transition. And one way to accelerate the, the progress on that discovery is to actually build computing machines that um, can model the processes inherent in, in nature in a much more efficient way. We know that modeling those classes of problems classically is very computationally expensive. In fact, we typically have to build supercomputers to be able to do that. And um, so, so this will have, you know, sort of like foundationally a lot of implications for this topic of sustainability and, and energy. And simply put, there are problems that like, you know, simulating carbon capture, for example, um, that are in just simply intractable with classical computers to achieve the level of fidelity that we want. So um, underneath this is the most extreme form of specialization. Now, here we're no longer talking about transistors. In, in our case at IBM, we build uh, our, our quantum computers uh, using superconducting transmon qubits. Uh, you're seeing a picture of what they look like on the right-hand side. There are these 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer structure that forms a Josephson junction uh, that allows us to have a very well-defined two-level system. And then by sending, you know, control energy, microwave pulses uh, down the cryostat into the device, we can actually control exquisitely uh, these two level systems and be able to perform superposition, entanglement and interference operations that are the basis of quantum computer. It is worth noting that as a superconducting device, uh, the two qubits, uh, you know, gate operating at five gigahertz with 100 nanosecond per gate performance consumes 10 to the minus 16 watts. So um, if you actually then do a comparison and you say, well, let's say you were trying to do a chemical calculation using a supercomputer uh, or, you know, uh, this, this um, you know, new, new category of systems of quantum computers, just to give you sort of ballpark numbers, and you're seeing on the right-hand side a number of, um, of supercomputers, numbers that are on the, you know, to just make it life simple, in the tens of megawatts is common uh, for a supercomputer, right? So you can see numbers on the right. For a quantum computer, you're talking tens of kilowatts. So it's a factor of a thousand there, right? And um, and 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 in fact, you know, and, and that's mostly driven by the cryogenics. Then they need to cool the environment around it, not so much inherently in the power dissipation because we have a superconducting device. Um, but in fact, that is even if you're assuming you're comparing apples to apples. As I alluded to in the world of quantum, there'll be classes of problems that are not just simply more costly to calculate classically, is that they're simply impossible to calculate classically. So in that, in that case, of course, uh, the denominator is, is very, very different. So I'll close now uh, with uh, you know, just a reference to an old article that I think is worth uh, you know, reading for a contrarian view um, on this topic of energy efficiency. And basically, you know, the obvious challenge that we confront on something that is so inherently useful as a world of information technology and computing is that we may indeed, uh, you know, be making information technology and computing much more efficient over time uh, by specialization and so on. But, um, but, you know, sometimes by making it so efficient and ubiquitous and uh, it's so useful for so many things that on aggregate you end up, you know, this is kind of like this, this tension that you can end up on aggregate consuming a lot more of it and even though on a per basis you're reducing, um, you know, the energy consumption per device, if the aggregate number of devices keeps growing exponentially, uh, you know, you, you're sort of confronting a, a different category altogether. So therefore, like the aggregate problem solving at the systems level, and meaning all of society, is ultimately the, the only metric and not uh, and make sure that we don't end up with pyrrhic uh, victories. So thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dario. That was a great talk. Um, okay, I guess I don't know if I uh, am I briefly giving. Okay, thanks. So I'm just going to briefly say a couple words about you know how we could um, kind of frame this thing because uh, I got cut off a bit. I think like we don't need to you know emphasize too much. We know you know uh, computing is growing, and we know we heard a lot from Jeff and Dario about increased demand for DNNs. Um, the other thing I just want to highlight, I don't know if this cut off was, of course, there's also increase in communication, primarily video, um, in terms of how, you know, we are communicating today. And of course, that's just not just a communication bandwidth, but also a computational bandwidth, because you need to, you know, compress and decompress the video itself. Um, the one thing I wanted to really get across is how do we go from 
compute to the carbon emissions itself and how we should think about these things. Uh, one, you know, one of the first steps I would like to think about is, you know, what to actually compute. And this is actually uh, dictated by the compute demands or how much, you know, how much video we need to compute and transmit, how much AI we need to process, how much data we need to analyze. Um, what dictates in terms of what we, how we actually process this data is looking at things like computing <laughs> algorithms, right? So for instance, um, you know, what are the types of models we want to run? Uh, you know, what video algorithms we want to do. And what's really critical here is that we need to achieve a certain quality of result, right? So you want your DNN models to be very accurate for a given task. You want your video compression algorithms to give you a certain quality of video. So it's really key here. Uh, we also need to consider, you know, where to actually run these algorithms on what hardware. Um, and so this is how I would frame thinking about how we want to compute. Um, and then this is going to be driven, this hardware that we have has to be driven by some form of compute energy. Um, and this is going to be affected by both the energy source as well as the energy delivery, right? Um, and this really kind of dictates, you know, where we're actually going to compute and that's going to affect the relationship between the carbon emissions and the actual compute energy that we use to drive the hardware itself. Um, of course, it's important to also mention that, you know, carbon emissions is not just for the operational aspect. And as uh, Dario also mentioned, there's a manufacturing and e-waste cost in terms of when we're thinking about the computing hardware. So that's also really important. And, you know, the questions that we should be looking at is really trying to understand what are the factors that impact each of these steps? So what affects what to compute, what affects how to compute, what affects, you know, where to compute? What are the challenges in each of these different kind of categories or steps? And what are the possible solutions? Uh, very briefly, I'll just talk about, you know, there's computing algorithms, which we already heard from Jeff and Dario in terms of there's, you know, many efficient ways that we can make DNN algorithms, you know, run more efficiently, whether it be sparsity, smaller models, or reduced precision. Of course, it's really important to think through, you know, what is the impact of, on the quality of result here? Another thing is looking at computing hardware. And Jeff and Dario both talked about, you know, looking at designing, you know, uh, domain specific hardware. And this is uh, increasingly important because we know that transistors are, themselves are not becoming more efficient, even though they have for the past decades, it's really been slowing down. So we need specialized or domain specific hardware to give us the efficiencies that we need, um, as well as exploring new device and materials for computing. Of course, there is also this additional question of how does this impact manufacturing costs or the carbon emissions of building all these new specialized hardware? Um, and then there's the question of where to actually do the computation itself. Um, and so this you know, is affected by you know, what is the energy source? What is the carbon intensity, which is basically the amount of carbon that's being generated per kilowatt of energy? And of course, this can vary per region, depending on where you are in the world. And Jeff highlighted um, that in his uh, work. And then also in terms of how much renewable energy you can use, and this can vary in terms of the different time of day. Um, there's also the energy delivery itself. So when you ship the energy to the actual computer, a lot of um, energy can be lost in things like the cooling and the power conversion. So as shown here, you know, uh, there's a huge, various different things that can impact uh, the efficiency or, efficiency which you're using the um, power itself. And this is quantified by the PUE. So all of these things will impact, you know, the carbon emissions. And, you know, you can try and move the workload to the place where you're going to be most uh, efficient in terms of carbon emissions. But then we have to also think about the impact of communication cost, right? So you can move your workload to uh, a data center that's being driven by renewable energies. But then what is the cost of moving that data from, let's say, your phone to uh, that data center itself. So these are all like different things that we need to think about. Um, and then finally, it's really important to think about what to compute. And Dario ended on the same thing, which is that, you know, we can do a great job in making computing and communication really efficient. But there is this tendency that once things are very efficient, people will use more of it. And then overall, it might resort to an overall increase in the usage of these technologies so of computing and then increase our overall carbon footprint so what are the things that we can do to kind of mitigate this maybe it is part of you know showing the user what is their carbon footprint as uh, jeff has mentioned and maybe that will change the way in which we kind of uh you know change our behavior and changes what we actually compute and allows us to think through you know is this worthwhile uh to actually compute or whatever tasks we're asking for um, just to connect it a little bit to the workshop agenda today, 
Um, so we've already heard these two great talks from Jeff and Dario. Um, and then coming up, we're going to be hearing about algorithms for fission computing, custom hardware for fission computing, and new architectures and material for computing. This really kind of centers around how to actually do the compute. Um, and then we're also going to hear about, you know, wireless network and distributed systems, energy efficient systems. And this is kind of covering the where to actually compute. And at the same time, we're also thinking about, you know, you know, what should we actually be computing and whether it's worth it or not. So hopefully that gives you kind of a quick summary in terms of how you might want to think about the different topics that are in today's workshop. Um, and so to start off the moderation, I want to ask uh, two quick questions. So let's start with the first one. Um, so, you know, over the, you know, past, you know, decade or so, we've been thinking about how to build energy efficient systems, whether it be building efficient systems for the phone or even efficient systems in the cloud, because we all know that there's, you know, limited energy. If you can make things more efficient, you can actually, um, you know, put more compute in the same uh, cloud itself. But one question I would have is, you know, how should we think differently when we think about building systems that are carbon efficient? Is there much of a difference between difference between you know carbon efficient systems and then energy efficient systems? Or should we still be proceeding the same way we've done for all these years in terms of trying to build just efficient systems? Who would you want to speak first? I yeah, go ahead, Anna. The only joke I want to make is that I promise I did not coordinate the New Yorker article with Vivian. Yeah, this is complete in, in the independent uh, thinking there. Paradoxically. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's really helpful to think about reducing energy. I think that's the primary goal. And if you have more specialized things that can reduce carbon in various ways, I think that's also worth thinking about. But if you think about the primary focus of reducing energy, I think, will go a long way to reducing carbon emissions. And I think I would emphasize that and then also think about things like carbon free energy approaches to uh, reducing carbon, uh, even if systems are consuming significant energy. But uh, making things energy efficient is a great goal and primary focus. Yeah, I I agree with that. And, and look, um, there's something about the you know, things that we design and we engineer, they have to be elegant as well. Like when things are so off, what we know is possible performance of, of something, I don't think it's an, we shouldn't be satisfied enough that we're offsetting it or, you know, it's very, you know, it's grossly inefficient on levels that we know it's possible. And I think as scientists, we should be very unsatisfied with that status quo, right? And I think particularly for the audience of the students, that what I would encourage men is not to drive like things are like 10%, 5%, uh, improvement. I mean, that's why I like, you know, I mean, I gave the example of some unconventional thinking and the example of quantum is that at sometimes you have to do something so incredibly hard, which is a collections of thousands of scientists over a long period of time to, to refound an entire field or do something that you can achieve then exponential changes to a problem. So I think that the ambition should be, of course, to, you know, do incrementally better on the efficiency front. But there are some tasks, and that's still the, the case for AI, right? And, uh, and or in the case of high-performance computing with simulation of materials and chemistry and so on, that I think we just have to be unsatisfied intrinsically by uh, how many orders of magnitude we're off between what we know is possible. Sounds good. Uh, I guess the, the other question I would have, given the audience, and we're here also at MIT with a lot of students and academics, is I think what role do you think uh, particular researchers, but academic researchers can play in um, addressing, you know, uh, the carbon footprint of computing and communication in the sense that, I mean, as Jeff, you pointed out, um, you know, sometimes there's limited kind of information that academics have in terms of how things are run in the company and where the carbon footprint actually is. So how do we uh, ensure that we understand where the carbon footprint is happening in industry because that's you know the source of where the carbon fo footprint is and how can we approach that as researchers to ensure that we're working on important problems that will make an impact in this space yeah i mean i think uh first i think a lot of the actual information of carbon uh, emissions and energy usage for say our our cloud uh, computing data centers is actually published so that people can understand those trade-offs themselves and, and sort of uh understand energy consumption of computations running in our environment. 
Um, I, I do think there's tons and tons of opportunities for academics to make huge contributions here across a really broad spectrum of areas. You know, uh, Dario mentioned things like, you know, very uh, fundamental improvements in semiconductor process things. I think some of that work can be done in academia with deep understanding of the materials and the, the sort of challenges when you get to those scales. Uh, I think coming up with sort of more efficient machine learning algorithms that are algorithmic improvements that improve uh, energy efficiency is another example at a very different level of the sort of stack of computing that we, we think about. Uh, I think uh, understanding uh, energy uh, efficiency of systems is a really important thing. Uh, building systems that are highly efficient and how, demonstrating how to do that in academia is a really good way to sort of get those things out into the world in a way that uh, sort of get adopted by, you know, the broad swath of, of practitioners in the, in the field, which I think is a way to have tremendous influence on how everyone does computing. Um, and, you know, thinking about things like quantum or other very different kinds of computing platforms, you know, uh, sort of analog computation for neural nets uh, has the potential of, of dramatic reduction in, in energy usage. But for example, we don't really know how to uh, have training algorithms that work on sort of neuromorphic style uh, computing platforms. So I think all these are just a few examples of ways that they're great academic uh, pursuits to really uh, affect the world in dramatic ways. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's such a rich area of, uh, of problems. And I guess my encouragement is to uh, maintain a balanced portfolio of advocacy in terms of investments across the whole fields of computing. Uh, you know, I, I, I think in some ways the unquestionable success of computer science and, uh, you know, and within it, AI is capturing the imagination, right, of students in a way that, you know, sometimes we actually have the challenge on this broader range of topics to make sure we continue to attract students to sustain and pursue work on these very hard areas as well. And that the, the contributions that, you know, having a diversity of fields being, you know, incredibly strong with very smart people contributing to all these dimensions across the stack ultimately can lift all boats. And that, you know, sort of to continue to make the case that if you make an innovation on a dielectric, right, and you improve the performance of a core transistor, and as a consequence of that, you make all computing more efficient, that's a massive contribution, right? And, uh, and that's very important. So, so I guess I'm passionate about that advocacy of, of making sure we have a balance of investments across all the realms of computing to achieve this uh, end objective. It's interesting because I think, I definitely think, obviously it's very uh, interesting and important to work in this space. I think it's always, I think challenging for sometimes researchers to kind of extrapolate in terms of what they're working on and where, to, I guess, mm -hmm. to ensure they're working on the right problem that's actually addressing something like climate. I think it's it's kind of, it's always been a challenge. You can kind of say your system's efficient, but in the grand scheme of things, what is the impact of that on the overall space? And um, but to be, to be uh, Vivian, but to be fair, like, honestly, this, this dimension, I mean, look, power performance, has always been an intrinsic element, yes. right, of, of, our, of our world. Um, I think adding this piece, which is our first question mm -hmm. of carbon, right, around that, and as an intrinsic element of the feedback loop on everything that we do, or how we get educated, how we design and build things and something, uh, it's a way to make that connection, right, by in every plot you show and every advance you make, you're sort of like, you know, benchmarking around that and also have a systems view of if the scale, what would it mean? And you ask questions about the sustainability of the fabrication process of it, or you know, are there enough materials to make that? So, I am hopeful that you know, as faculty and so on, that that context setting and asking the right questions and making sure the right benchmarks are published and so on can drive a lot of influence. Right. I think that's the hope that I think because because the question relating carbon to energy is often, I guess sometimes yeah. a little bit more proprietary within industry, it's harder to make that connection, I find sometimes versus like computing and energy. That's an easier um, and more traditional thing that we optimize for. And I think that the connection to carbon can be, uh, at least I've found to be a bit of a challenge. I mean, one, one quick point on that. I, I mean, I think it's, 
it is really important that when you are working on energy and working on you know reducing carbon emissions of something that you have the big picture context in in your mind like what is the actual carbon uh, you know emissions of this in the overall world and how does that compare to other things that you could also consider working on that and reduce their carbon emissions i think this is a really you know, good kind of back of the envelope kind of calculation to do anytime you're, you're thinking about these issues. Because, um, you know, we all need to work on, on the most important things and have good information about it and have uh, the focus be on the things that will make the most difference. Um, I guess one other question I have would be related to, I think, kind of the uh, two things. So one is, I think, uh, obviously, you know, for example, data centers have become much more efficient, primarily, you know, because we're going to hyperscale, we could, there's, we've eliminated a lot of the overhead. Um, but at the same time, I guess demand keeps on going up, maybe also because of Jovin's paradox. So we've kind of, you know, dealt with all the low hanging fruit now, I guess, maybe, maybe it wasn't low hanging fruit, it's a lot of challenge, but we've made the data center, you know, PUE is very close to one, everything's very efficient. Um, so how do you imagine, and I think it's a difficult question, how do you imagine closing that gap with the demand keeping like, you know, skyrocketing, but we've already th removed a lot of inefficiencies out of the existing systems that we have? Um, how does one? Well, I mean, uh, we alluded already to some of it. I mean, the, there's that aspect of it, but there's like the workload mapping and efficiency. I mean, I gave examples of that. You could be a one-to-one, -one, but like if you're storing it on hard disk drive versus this, like there, there's a lot of value to be gained there systematically across the thing. How are you storing the data? And that's why I was, I was talking about the, you know, elegance as a general principle of engineering too, is if you don't need to retrieve the data with that latency, why are you using such an inefficient data to store information? It doesn't seem right, right? And I think sometimes if things are not right, we should just do not do them, right? Like we should just go in a direction of keeping change. So I actually think there's a tremendous amount of uh, efficiency improvements by analyzing everything we do around workload, actual needs, and mapping the right infrastructure against it. I think there's lots of gain to be made on um, on that front. Um, anyway, so that's it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would totally agree. I mean, I think the point of specialization is to build things that are purpose suited for really important aspects of your workload or large things that consume large fractions of your workload. And to date, we tend to not specialize, you know, custom chips for things as much as we could because the uh, effort required to design a specialized chip is actually quite large. You know, it's, you know, 10, 50 or 100 people for, you know, multiple years. If you could work on techniques that enable you to get that down so that you could design a customized chip with much more automation and have you know, a team of three people in a few weeks design a chip, that would dramatically increase the scope of specialization we could do and get much more efficiency in all the kinds of things that are kind of not quite at the threshold of meeting those fixed costs. But if those fixed costs dramatically reduce, you'll be able to specialize things much more and get much more efficiency for for many things. And I think that's that's a really important thing. And I also think end-to-end -end optimization of the chip design process and the fabrication process is going to be helpful. At the moment, sort of, there's many layers of abstraction there. And they each kind of have their own safety tolerances and, and margins of safety built in. And they kind of accumulate on each other. And that's helpful when you have humans kind of thinking about designing at this layer and then going down to the next layer and doing sort of further optimization. But if we have the ability to end to end optimize things, you know, you may discover that you don't need nearly as much safety tolerance for this particular, you know, circuit you're trying to put onto a semiconductor process. And it may be perfectly fine to, to shrink things further than, than what the sort of uh, uh, conservative margins of safety have been built in uh, uh, sort of require. And so I think there's, there's tremendous optimization opportunities for better specialization, uh, sort of end-to-end -end optimization across many levels of the stack. I guess one follow-up question is like, with the specialization, how do we think about like the manufacturing carbon emissions for that specialization? I think that's always something I also struggle thinking through. So how, how do you guys think through that aspect? Because we will need more specialized shift to deal with the operational cost, and as we said, op optimizing across the stack. But then we have 
to manufacture many more chips? Um, typically, the fixed cost associated with a manufacturing plant is the overwhelming uh, part of the equation, right? Like what wafers get run on that, obviously. There is a connection uh, in terms of masks, right? And mask costs, obviously, the more, you know, <laughs> the more thing you got to make more masks. Uh, if you're using very novel materials, right? There's an implications to that. So, yeah, I mean, it would be good to quantify it. I mean, if you push it to the extreme around it, but I would say, you know, to first order 80% of the story uh, is going to be pretty fixed linked to the overall scale of the semiconductor fab overall. Yeah, and if you need one chip instead of 30 to do the same work, it's definitely going to be a win, even if there are you know additional. Uh, I, I do think looking at the manufacturing footprint of uh, computing equipment is one thing that has not gotten as much attention and definitely is worth uh, you know attention because I think that is often where a pretty significant carbon emissions footprint, the scope three emissions of of these kinds of uh, supply chain uh, and uh, manufacturing processes is definitely. Uh, you know, needs attention. Yeah. So, so look, on, uh, on, on the topic of sustainability, we've talked a lot about energy and CO2, but like the sustainability of like the overall footprint in terms of chemicals and so on that get used is a hugely difficult problem, right? So, I mean, just to give a concrete example on the fabrication process, just like the semiconductor lithography material that gets used, the photoresist, the photoacid generators that get used in it, being able to, when you pass regulations where you have to remove certain components of this, just changing that, it's a massive scientific endeavor. And in the end, you have to do it. So I think there's a lot of sustainability dimensions of the manufacturing process itself that we got to deal as well and confront. I mean, it's kind of like the equivalent to the rare earth, rare earth discussion that we have you know, around the world. Like, how are you going to find it? How are you going to process? How are you going to make that efficient? That's going to be a huge part of the equation. And these problems are not easy to solve. Uh, and that's why we need to all work on them, uh, sustain over long periods of time. <laughs> yes, for sure. So I think that these, uh, you know, thank you very much for all your comments. I think these are all, you know, important points The need to, you know, optimize across the stack, the need to think about the sustainability of the hardware manufacturing itself. And we hope to kind of cover these topics for the rest of the workshop today. Again, I want to thank you so much for your insights today. Um, and so right now we're going to break for 15 minutes and uh, please join us again at 11.45 for the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you for having us. Thank you.